Equium aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. And every week, we will have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by the headliner giving us a keynote presentation. And today, we are thrilled to have Dr. Samog Bansal as our opener speaker to talk about the alpha interpolation in a Lee group framework, and also Professor Chen Fan Fujiang as our headliner to talk about continuum rapture discrete particles. And first, it's my pleasure to introduce Samog. Samok is currently a postdoc researcher at the Interdigital Research and Innovation Renaissance France. He completes his PhD recently in the area of 3D vision and geometry processing under the supervision of Dr. Antia Tatu at the IICT. And he also has a master's degree in IICT with a specialization in machine intelligence. His research interests include 3D shape analysis, geometric deep learning, image processing, and computer vision. And today he is going to share his recent paper, Alpha Interpolation in a Lee Group Framework at SIGGRAPH, at SIGGRAPH 2019. And let's welcome Smunk. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, is it working? Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Mm, hello, everyone. It's nice to be here. Today, I'm going to talk about affine interpolation, which is a fundamental operation in application related to formation, modeling, animation, and motion design. Let's take a simple example to understand affine interpolation. Assume that we have two tetrahedron, A0 and A1, related by a global affine transformation T, and we want to generate intermediate tetrahedrons. Mathematically, this task boils down to taking the root of the affine transformation T. This process of taking the root of the affine transformation or generating intermediate objects between a pair of objects related by a global affine transformation is known as is known as affine interpolation. Now, there are several papers that address the same problem. I have listed some of them here. One of the most popular approach is decomposing affine transformation into simpler transformations where the interpolation is well defined. For example, the polar decomposition where an affine transformation is broken down into rotation and shear or scale component. But this de uh, decomposition process is not intuitive and leads to unintuitive results in several cases. In more direct scheme of affine interpolation, for example, the approach proposed by Rozaknek et al., the interpolation is not defined for all the transformation. I'm going to discuss a geometrically meaningful decomposition approach, which ensures an intuitive solution in all the cases. So let's start. The idea is simple. We start with a pair of tetrahedron A0 and A1. We represent these tetrahedrons by elements of a Lie group M. The interpolation is performed in the Lie group space, and in an interpolated tetrahedron is computed using an inverse process from the inter, uh, interpolated Lie group element. Now, for those who don't have a uh, background in Lie groups, a Lie group is a group and a smooth manifold such that the group multiplication and inversion operations are smooth. Hopefully, things will be more clear in the coming slide. Now, let's talk about the Lie group representation of a tetrahedron. The Lie group representation consists of a set of transformation needed to deform a given uh, tetrahedron into a fixed canonical tetrahedron. So let's say uh, we are given a tetrahedron and a fixed canonical tetrahedron with a given correspondence between their vertices. The first transformation which we apply on the given tetrahedron is a rigid transformation, which aligns vertex U0 to origin. It aligns a joining vertex U0 and U1 to x-axis such that vertex v2 lies in the xy plane with positive y coordinate. So after this uh, 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 the transformation, the first phase, uh, the shaded phase over here of both the tetrahedrons lie in the same plane with their first edge aligned. Second transformation is a uniform scaling such that the first edge of the given tetrahedron uh, matches with the first edge of canonical tetrahedron. Uh, now, we only have vertex W2 and W3 uh, to be aligned to the corresponding vertices on the canonical tetrahedron, for which a shear transformation is used. 
And this shear transformation in addition to aligning vertex W2 and W3 also preserve the already aligned vertices. Now, each tetrahedron can be represented by a set of these transformations. Each of these transformations belongs to a Lie group. And as the product of Lie group is also a Lie group, uh, the representation belongs to a Lie group. The group action on this Lie group is defined as composition over the individual Lie groups. Now, we need a specialized tool uh, in order to work on Lie groups. Uh, for example, the exponential and log map, which can be seen as a generalization of addition and subtraction operation in the Euclidean in, in space. The tangent vector between two points is given by the log map. Uh, for example, vector u over here represent uh, the tangent vector between identity and point p, while vector v represent the tangent vector between point p and q. Uh, both of these vectors belong to uh, uh, the tangent space at identity, which can be identified with Lie algebra. Exponential map is the inverse of the log map. It maps a tangent vector to a point in the Lie group along a unique integral curve corresponding to the tangent vector. So starting from identity, point P is given by the exponential of vector u, while point Q is given by exponential of vector v translated to point P. Once we have log and exponential map, the interpolation path is just a sampling of integral curve between these two points. In special circumstances, uh, these integral curves are also called geodesics. Uh, these operations are easy to understand in Euclidean space using simple addition and subtraction. Uh, in this work, we only use uh, matrix Lie groups. So Lie algebraic exponential and log map coincides with matrix exponential and log map. Now, with exponential and log map defined on the Lie groups, we now have everything needed to uh, define a fine interpolation. So the interpolation between point M0 and M1 is defined by this expression over here. Subsequently, the interpolated tetrahedron can be computed by following an inverse process. Now, in case we start with an affine transformation, uh, a pair of tetrahedron can be computed by applying the inverse of the transformation on the canonical tetrahedron, and we are back to the first case. Now, there are certain um, properties and interpolation framework should satisfy. Uh, first one being existence and uni uni uniqueness, which intuitively means that for any affine transformation, the interpolation should exist and it should be unique. It can be proved that for a pair of oriented tetrahedron, a unique orientation preserving affine transformation exists, which given the proposed framework can be uniquely decomposed, of course, with a uh, fixed choice of vertex ordering and correspondence. The second property is uh, for isometric transformations, which says that if underlying transformation is an isometry, then the interpolated transformation should also be an isometry. Volume preservation and monotonic variation of volume are another set of properties which demands that the change in the volume should be monotonic. And if there is no change at all, the interpolated transformation should also preserve uh, the volume. Then. There is a property of reversibility, which means that the path of interpolation should not change the interpolation. That is, interpolation from A0 to A1 should be same as interpolation from A0, A1 to A0. The proposed framework respects all of these properties, and for mathematical proofs, our paper can be referred. Another important property introduced in the work of Rosarnak uh, is the property of steadiness, which means that the interpolation should be uniform. Mathematically, it is equivalent to the interpolated transformation at step t being equal to the tth root of the transformation. Now, while the proposed framework is not studied in all the cases, it can be shown mathematically that if the underlying transformation belongs to uh, individual group of rigid uh, scale shear transformation or it's a mixture of shear scale transformation, the interpolation is steady. We compare the results of, uh, with several existing approaches. Each column contains an example with varying degree of component transformations. R, T, S, and A here represent a rotation, translation, shear, and scale. As can be seen uh, for the first three approaches, that in several cases, not all the properties uh, are preserved. Uh, the result uh, produced by Rosaknik approach are very similar to our approach, but in several cases, the interpolation 
do not exist. While our approach provides intuitive solution in each case. Now, there are two assumptions in the underlying um, frame, uh, framework. One is the choice of uh, canonical tetrahedron, and another one is the choice of vertex ordering. While the proposed framework is robust with respect to the choice of canonical tetrahedron, it does depend on vertex ordering. Okay, if the underlying transformation is a rigid transformation or it's a mixture of rigid and scaled transformations, the interpolation remains unchanged. In all other cases, the change in the interpolation is proportional to the amount of shear present in the transformation. More results are provided in our paper. Just to summarize, uh, we discuss a geometrically inspired affine interpolation framework, which has several interesting properties. It can be, uh, it can also be used in many applications related to volumetric and triangular mass processing. Uh, these are re relevant references. Third one being our paper. Uh, I would like to thank the team here for inviting me, and I would be happy to answer any question you might have. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for the great talk. And as usual, we will move on to our headliner and have a joint Q&A session in the end. Then I have to say, I'm super excited to introduce our headliner, Professor Chen Fan Fuzhang, because each year at SIGGRAPH, I believe many of us are literally amazed by like another dozen of new MPM papers in simulating new natural phenomena from his group. And finally, we got a chance today to invite <coughs> him to TGC and share like how he gets inspired by simulating killing some Dongpur plot. And so Fan Fu is an assistant professor of computer and information science at the University of Pennsylvania. And after four years at UPenn, starting in July 2021, he will be an assistant professor of mathematics at the University of California, Los Angeles, where he received his PhD degree back in 2015. So Fan Fu is a recipient of the UCLA Edward K. Wright <coughs> Outstanding Doctoral Student Award, NSF CRI Award, and also NSF Career Award. He has published 27 papers in SIGGRAPH and SIGGRAPH Asia, and his current research interests include numerical algorithms facilitating advance in computer graphics, computational physics, and inverse problems, mainly in structural mechanics, vision, and robotics. And today, specifically, he is going to share some of, some of his thoughts in continuum rapture and discrete particles. So let's welcome Professor Chen Fan Fuzhang. Thank you, Aris, for the introduction. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Fan Fu from UPenn. As, as Aris just mentioned, I was at UPenn for a wonderful four years. Um, but starting on, starting on July 1st, I'll be moving back to UCLA where I got my PhD from. So like the title says here, um, this talk is about modeling rupture, fracture, and destruction of continuum materials using discrete particles. And the numerical method I'm focusing on today is the material point method, MPM. So for for those of you who haven't heard of MPM before, especially if you don't work on physics-based simulation, MPM is similar to finite elements, but it uses particles, not meshes, to represent objects. And you may have seen some MPM simulations in movies for things like snow, water, sand, and viscous goo, basically all kinds of solids, fluids, and mixtures of them. So why MPM? Why use particles? Well, first, MPM obeys the updated Lagrangian kinematics. A lot of you are probably familiar with the total Lagrangian view. And total Lagrangian mainly looks at the material space and the current space to study a deformation map. Updated Lagrangian additionally treats time n plus one configuration as a deformation from time n configuration. The kinematics of interest is the intermediate deformation flow phi hat which is the function of time and locations. 
This means that you don't track stuff all the way back to space zero. You don't even need to store a mesh for it. The updated runjin allows NPM to robustly handle extremely large deformations and topological changes. That makes it ideal for both solids and fluids, as well as flowing materials like snow or sand. And second, NPM has intrinsic collision handling due to the underlying interpolation routines averaging velocities on the grid. So NPM collisions aren't entirely physically accurate due to this averaging, but NPM materials naturally resist interpenetration for free. Furthermore, NPM has been extended to simulate a wide range of effects. And finally, NPM as a PDE discretization scheme can be made quite accurate. It not only produces animations, but also is extremely useful in simulation-based engineering science. So NPM has already seen extended use for predicting gravitational hazards like avalanches and landslides. And today I will show a bit of our recent work on glacier carving and tsunamis with NPM. Now, why do we care about how materials fail over time? Well, as you might imagine, physically modeling fracture is extremely useful to many fields, including video games, which we see here, represented by a recent clip of Crackdown 3's uh, real-time destruction system. There's also visual effects for movies shown above right through the final city leveling shot of the 1990s Fight Club. And finally, the fields of mechanical and civil engineering, they have focused on modeling fracture for many years to prevent the type of disaster shown in this image below, showing the uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse due to strong winds uh, in 1940. Unfortunately, despite all of this serious motivation, fracture remains quite a difficult natural phenomenon to model in an elegant and robust way. So naturally, each application of fracture modeling has different ideas about what successful fracture modeling should achieve. Real-time applications would strongly favor speed over accuracy and often avoid fracture physics entirely, while offline simulation for movies and visual effects focuses more on artistic control and the look of fracture rather than accuracy. Finally, engineering applications were the first to inspire the study of the physics behind fracture due to a need for predictive accuracy rather than the speed or look only. So for the purpose of this talk, I'll focus somewhere in between the look-driven approaches in graphics and the physically accurate approaches in engineering. Finally, I want to give you some intuition about what pieces we need for successful fracture modeling. The first is some governing physical theory that describes how cracks begin and how they grow. The second is a way to discretize material geometry and the underlying PDEs that govern the fracture. And lastly, we need a way to track and represent the growing crack front, which can be tricky due to the extreme topology change that's intrinsic to fracture. Here we'll be focusing on three of our recent works. The first work, CDMPM from 2019, builds a basic MPM discretization for the variational continuum mechanics theory for damage mechanics. The second work, NISO MPM from last year, it's an even better augmented MPM solver for modeling the fracture of anisotropic materials like meat and mozzarella cheese. This NISO MPM also contains an additional approach to modeling extremely stiff inextensible fibers, um, but more on this later. And finally, the third work is not in graphics, but in earth and environment science. Here we developed a new constitutive model to accurately match real world analytical models for glacial carving and tsunami genesis. Now I'll break down these works into three pieces. The first is how we approach modeling material damage over time. And this can be done with either meshed or unmeshed discretizations. The second is how we model the material's elastic response or how strongly it resists elastic deformation during breaking. 
And finally, some approaches are able to model material fracture uh, through tracking the material plasticity. That concerns how much a material hardens or softens under the deformation. Now, before diving in, let's go over NPM really quickly. So NPM discretizes the material both as a set of particles and as a grid of nodes. It uses particles to keep track of data like velocity and position, while the grid nodes are used as a scratch pad for derivative computations. The core loop of NPM entails transferring data from the particle view to the grid view, and then using the grid to perform force computations and update velocities. Then the updated velocities are transferred back to the particles and used to advect particle positions, and then the loop repeats. So looking at this algorithmic flow, the green boxes indicate particle views, and the yellow boxes show the grid view. We can begin at the top left where we have particle positions, masses, and velocities. Then step one is to transfer mass and momentum to the grid using some interpolation routine. So labeled one, we see the grid mass and momentum. Then step two calculates the external internal forces on the body so that in step three, we can time step the velocities on the grid. Internal elasticity is usually modeled using a constitutive model that gives us a relationship between the deformation and the material's energy density or stress. So for example, we could use a fixed correlated model or neo hooking elasticity, standard uh, models. Then velocities transfer back to the particles in step eight. And then step nine, it affects particle positions. And the really cool thing here to notice is that to augment NPM with different effects from Newtonian dynamics to do things like melting or fracture, we can introduce new data to the particle view, like temperature or material damage or phase field, whatever um, physical quantities. Then we can transfer this to the grid and then use the grid to update these elements by solving the corresponding PDEs before transferring them back to the particles. You may also wonder about step four to seven. These steps are unique to modeling plasticity within NPM. Step four shows updated Lagrangian deformation gradients. Step five shows that we use these deformation gradients to check whether a particle's stress is inside of what's known as a yield surface. And if not, step six will perform a routine called return mapping for this particle based on the second law of thermodynamics. Otherwise, we skip to step seven. And in any case, for simplicity, you can think of NPM's treatment of plasticity as just an additional constraint projection for the admissible deformation gradient. Next, I'll talk about continuum damage mechanics and phase field fracture. A lot of existing work on fracture utilize linear elastic fracture mechanics which requires explicit modeling the evolving and branching crack geometry. Conversely, continuum damage mechanics uses a smeared crack approach, also known as diffuse crack modeling. This assumes that the material remains a smooth continuum and the separation resistance is weakened at the cracks. Within the CDM framework, damage can be modeled either locally, such as through comparing uh, local stresses with some defined maximal stress, or non-locally through tracking a scalar field of damage variables evolving over time. So this later approach is called phase field fracture. We can augment NPM with phase field fracture through tracking the damage in the particle view and evolving the damage variables on the grid, which then in turn will affect the force computations during the dynamics. The phase values are between zero and one. It's just some convention people would pick uh, with zero being healthy materials and the one being fully damaged. In the image on right, the disk is a continuum in material space at the left. And the phase is tracked such that in the high damage red region, we can see the material separation in the deformed space because the material is being weakened at the crack. The damage variables that we track and evolve would influence the, part the material's elastic response through a method of elastic damage coupling, also known as elasticity degradation. So in this context, we would achieve this by multiplying the, 
multiplying the stress a monotonic degradation function. Um, we call it G here. It's based on the current damage value. When damage is one, the stress will be fully lost. So now that you've seen how we track damage in the particles, let's very briefly look at some details about the theory behind, um, because we still need the PDE for the damage evolution. It begins with Griffith theory of fracture. It's an expression for the total free energy of the material. And it's defined to be the summation of the elastic potential and the released energy at the crack surface. So here, C hat is a degraded energy density. Gamma is the internal crack surface. And G is called critical energy release rate due to fracture. Sometimes it's also called fracture toughness. Let's say if we can um, somehow change this surface integral to a volume integral, then over, over the material space of uh, omega zero, then we could express the total energy using an energy density function. And, and this energy density function C of the, will be of the deformation gradient F and also the phase field value C. This means the total energy in terms of F and C is simply would be an integration over the energy density. We can then define the energy density to be the balance between the degraded elasticity and the energy released from fracture. The first term is very easy. Basically, we separate the elastic energy into two pieces, and one for separation and one for compression. Then we degrade the separation resistance in elasticity. The second one is more interesting. It basically, it regularizes the original surface integral and approximates it with a volume integral. This is a geometric regularization. Let's next look at how this is derived. Basically, um, the problem is simple. We have a surface integral of the crack gamma. If we don't consider the, the, the energy release rate G, the integral it just computes the area of this internal crack. Now we want to pretend it has a finite width so we can approximate it with a volume integral over a narrow region surrounding it. And we can motivate this fully from geometry um, by looking at 1D. So this is 1D and uh, it's kind of semi 1D. Basically we're considering an infinitesimal wide bar that has infinity length. And the cross section, um, is, let's call it gamma, it's, it's gonna be the crack. And let's say this bar is fully cracked at x equals to zero. So, your, so the problem domain is the B um, with, uh, with um, gamma and L. And then this topology can be described by a simple damage indicator function dx. So d equals to one and x equals to zero and d equals to zero everywhere else. It's discontinuous. To regularize this little impulse, we can introduce a short length l, then rewrite dx as a smooth exponential function e to the minus x over l. And when l goes to zero, dx asymptotically converges to the original sharp crack. There are many other ways to regularize, but the exponential function is chosen for a reason. Basically, just by observation, you can see it's the solution of this homogeneous differential equation d minus l squared d prime prime equals to zero. Of course, under the, the Dirichlet boundary conditions at zero and infinity. Now, based on basic finite element theory, we can write out the weak form of this ODE. Using the variation of D, then we can find its variational formulation. Or in other words, uh, it's easy to see that this functional I'm writing here, I of D, it's, it's an integral of the volumetric domain B. It's all the grounding equation that, that tries to find its uh, extrema will be this differential equation for D. So now we know the solution of D is the minimizer of the functional. If we plug it in, replace dV, the, the volume integral with gamma times dx. And then we do the analytical integration in 1D from minus infinity to infinity. The resulting functional value actually becomes something very simple. It's gonna be equal to L times gamma. 
And of course, what we care more about is gamma because gamma is the original surface integral. So we can modify this functional a little bit by dividing out L from this functional I. That allows us to find a scaled functional. And when we evaluate this scaled functional at the solution, we would get gamma regardless of what L is. Even, you, even though you pick a super large L, this will still give you uh, extreme value for this functional being the, being the gamma, being the original surface integral result. In other words, when we do this, this scaled functional can actually be considered as a cracked surface area itself. And th this is only true in 1D, of course. In 1D, we get this exact crack area. Uh, this just serves as an intuition. But in 3D, the result is similar. And um, this is essentially called the gamma convergence theory. As L goes to zero, the regularized functional will converge to the original functional with surface integrals. And this theory, if, I, if you do some computer vision, you'll know this theory is very similar to the AT2 regularization uh, of the mumford shaw problem in image processing from the early days. But anyway, in the end, by introducing the damage field or the phase field, the energy released by the crack now becomes a volume integral over the smooth damage field. And that allows us to spatially discretize the problem with quite standard finite elements, or in our case, material points. I'm skipping more details on, on extending the variational principle to the dynamic case uh, in which you need to use the, the concept of incremental potential to include the inertia term uh, with velocities. But in short, the phase field degrades the elastic energy at the crack and also appears in the released energy term as a volume integral. So overall, we get a coupled governing equations, one for Newtonian dynamics and one for damage evolution shown here. And don't worry too much about all these symbols here. And the big takeaway is really just that this discretized equation really strongly resembles a discretized parabolic PDE, like what you do when you discretize a heat conduction or diffusion. And algebraically, this linear system is just a diagonal matrix plus a Laplacian, very easy to discretize with NPM. And it's symmetric positive definite, so you can solve it quite efficiently. And also know that this equation, um, without worrying about too much details, when uh, it actually introduces two key parameters for artistic control. One is the mobility constant, MC. That one dictates the speed of crack propagation, uh, while the energy release rate, G, you already see from the origin integral, it will affect the material's resistance to fracture. So sometimes it's called fracture toughness. And as you can see from these unit tests, changing these two parameters will give a quite high degree of artistic control. Now let's look at the algorithmic data flow. Compared to traditional NPM, the first key feature here is that we now additionally track phase per particle and perform a similar set of steps to transfer, solve, and update phase values. And since we're treating a variational problem, many optimization approaches can be taken. We can use the simple uh, staggered alternating minimization here, just for simplicity. Basically, we fix the phase field value and then minimize over velocity or displacement. Then we fix velocity and minimize over phase. Then we iterate until things converge. In this diagram, the blue arrow shows that we use the particle's current deformation gradient in the phase solve on the grid because you need to evaluate the current um, elastic stress. And then once the phase is solved and transferred back, the red arrow shows that we use the updated particle phase in the force computation to ensure that we have updated damage before we compute forces. As for the dynamics of the system, they are discretized in the same way as traditional NPM, with the only difference being that the grid force updates, now it needs to incorporate the updated phases to degrade the, the elastic potential and weaken the material at the crack. So when things move, they will be allowed to separate uh, along the crack surface. This example shows the rupture dynamics from tensile loading. And stretching is the most simple way of breaking apart soft materials. 
to really see what's going on with the damage mechanics, it helps to visualize the phase field. So blue is the healthy region of the material and the red is the degraded part. And the red tends to concentrate at the crack region. This is especially true when we shrink that regularization parameter L. The smaller it is, the more concentrated the crack will be. Next, when we shoot this jello T-Rex with a bullet using, this is using traditional NPM uh, without any damage. Uh, there's some fracture. The fracture pattern is at the mercy of unpredictable numerical fracture, which is a unique type of NPM fracture that occurs when material is forced to tear non-physically. This kind of fracture happens simply because some NPM particles are, are stretched. They become too far away from their neighbors. So even as far as the grid sees, they don't see each other anymore. So things break. And incorporating the damage mechanics is the only way to get the desired trajectory through the T-Rex uh, from this compressive uh, damage inside the body. And here is the visualized damage. One of the greatest feature of NPM is that all you need is a point cloud. Without, you don't need to visualize anything or build any mesh. So for things with microstructures, like this bread. Sometimes it's really hard to build a high quality tetrahedral mesh to run finite elements. But with NPM, it's easy to sample points. Uh, even if you get things, the original data from for, for biomechanical things like from CT or MRI scans. And here I want to say that a widespread misunderstanding of NPM is that it is more computationally expensive than finite elements. I see such claims in so many um, papers, uh, either published or, or I reviewed. This is actually wrong because using particles act allows you to capture subgrid features at a much finer scale than the actual resolution discretized on the grid. So actually in quite a number of cases for the same level of visual details with, with the same number of degree of freedoms, say NPM uh, or with the same quality of the visual effects, NPM would require much less degree of freedoms than finite elements. So it will run much faster. Okay, so, so far we're only modeling isotropic materials and, and those, or, or those that have a completely uniform structure to them. And it's better to be more general and go anisotropic. Firstly, isotropic materials behave the same in every direction. Its elastic response is the same regardless of the material space coordinate system. Second, transversely isotropic materials have an underlying structure that strengthens just one axis of the material. And we'll call this axis A1. Many biological tissues exhibit transverse isotropy, including muscles, which allow different deformations in the uh, longitudinal and uh, transverse directions. And finally, orthotropic materials can define three mutually orthogonal axes that can each have different material responses. We only need to label two of them. So we add A2 to label the second axis. The most intuitive example of orthotropic material is wood, where the underlying fibers change the behavior in the axial, radial, and circumferential directions. So with that in mind, let's take a quick look at some of the theory behind anisotropic crack propagation. Now we have an underlying sense of the material's directional strengths, and as such, we need a way to incorporate this into the governing physics. Basically, now we adopt a so-called crack driving state function that's shown success for biological tissues. The exact form of this d delta shown at the top is like a heat source term on the damage evolution equation and the zeta would control the slope of the driving force. Then the brackets are called Macaulay brackets and preserve positive values while flattening all negative values to zero. So it's like uh, the ReLU function in machine learning. And finally, sigma plus is the tensile portion, the stretching portion of Cauchy stress. And you can compute it simply by manipulating the eigenvalues of the stress. So this one will only keep those um, stresses in, the, in, the, in a certain material point that's trying to separate things. 
Next, we can define expression phi. It's a, it's a function of the tensile stress. Then we can introduce here the notion of the critical stress, sigma c. It's like a threshold that will dictate how much stress a material can withstand before fracturing. And most important of all, this the second order tensor A here, it's called a structural tensor that encodes the material's intrinsic fiber directions. So in the fourth row, you can see the structure of this tensor. Um, recall that A1 and A2 are the fiber directions. And we construct this tensor by adding contributions from each of these directions to the identity matrix using the alpha one and alpha two parameters um, with outer products to weight these contributions. Uh, as you can imagine, the, these alphas also give us a, a control over the type of anisotropy. For example, a material can be changed from orthotropic to transversely isotropic by simply setting alpha two to zero. And even further, it can be made to isotropic by setting both alphas to zero. An intuitive way to understand the structural tensor is that uh, the identity encodes the isotropic response and each directional basis evaluates the squared magnitude of the traction along that direction. The traction equals to the, the stress times the direction. And, and traction is really the, uh, the physical meaning of traction is uh, the, the density of force. So the plots on the right show the behavior of the state function for, for three different fiber orientations, as well as an isotropic material. And notice how for the 90 degree fibers, as the stress increases in the fiber direction sigma two, D delta stays constant, but it increases quite rapidly due to stress in the weak orthogonal direction. So things break along the fiber rather than break the fiber. And conversely, for the isotropic material, it responds identically to stresses in every direction. The anisotropic damage mechanics is very similar to the previous isotropic one. Um, but since it can use the explicit forcing term like a heat source, it's very easy to solve the damage evolution equation using explicit integration. That makes it more flexible and faster for, especially for moderately stiff materials. Now let's get some intuition behind the material um, effects attainable through tuning these damage parameters. And this is a 45 degree fiber block tearing using explicit damage. The top row shows the effect of increasing the critical stress, sigma c. And as you can see, this increases the material's resistance to fracturing. In the bottom row, we show the effect of drastically increasing the correct speed, eta. This shows the sensitivity of this parameter. And in the discretization, the time step size delta t is actually divided by uh, the parameter eta. So eta is like heat conductivity, if you could, uh, if you want an analogy. And as such, tiny eta values uh, can actually cause stability problems when you use explicit damage because that's breaking the CFL condition. And more specifically, if we, want to if we want to simulate an extremely fast crack, we can use an extremely small eta value, but this can cause explicit time integration to explode. And for such cases, implicit damage formulation is better because it affords us the ability to use larger time steps and very small eta values for the fast crack propagation. And to kick things off, here's a 45 degree fiber tube being stretched until it fractures. However, each of these four rounds uses a um, different combination of components. The top left is a four framework work. And as you can see, we get a nice clean fracture there. The top right shows a round with isotropic damage and isotropic elasticity. The most insightful rounds, however, are on the bottom. On the bottom left, we show the effect of using anisotropic damage, but we use isotropic elasticity. And on the right, we show a run with no damage at all, but using anisotropic elasticity. And the tube stretches much further because this fracture is now purely numerical. So what we concluded here is really that to model anisotropic fracture propagation, uh, you have to consider both anisotropic fracture propagation the damage evolution, you have also have to also incorporate anisotropic elasticity. 
This one is the, the isotropic tube on the compression. And if we add vertical fibers to the tube, we get a nice clean split down the middle due to this, uh, this particular structure. Here's the dumpo puck. So we can also peel apart the layers of piece of dumpo puck belly using different anisotropic settings. First, let's try isotropy. But clearly, this only allows us to tear a pathetic piece away because things behave the same in every direction. And when, when it's stretched, it breaks. Next, we could add a flat diagonal fiber to enable transverse isotropy. Now we're at least able to peel away a strip of the meat. And finally, if we add a secondary fiber directions to model orthotropy, and then we can now peel apart the individual layers. Here we also color the particle damage uh, in the top right to visualize the evolving planar crack. And for more complex muscle-like structures, we can solve the, solve the Laplace equation um, to get a smooth flow field. Let's allow, then we can use that to sample a kind of approximate fiber, muscle fiber directions. And that allows us to sample it on each particle and capture more interesting fracture patterns. And next, this transversely isotropic string cheese is pulled in eight directions to partially peel apart the stringy fibers uh, that's intrinsic to, the, to a pulled cheese like this uh, mozzarella. And next, this orange is simulated with radial fibers and each with local transverse isotropy. Basically, in NPM, you don't have to use the same fiber direction for, for uh, every particle. You could, every, every particle could have a totally different thing uh, that, that's prescribed based on the actual uh, feature of the object. And of course, when we do add an astrop damage, uh, we get the characteristic tearing along the grain of the meat we want. So for this one, we actually sample the fiber direction using the texture map. Uh, kind of extrapolated the patterns in, in, into the object. And this shows the evolving damage. So now that we've seen all of these approaches to modeling damage, let's explore designing elasticity for the fracture. And recall that we achieve elasticity degradation by multiplying a monotonic degradation function G that's based on the current damage. The key here for fracture, however, is that we can choose to selectively degrade whatever contribution of the elastic energy we want to weaken. And intuitively for fracture, this means that we want to selectively degrade the elasticity associated with the tensile stress to allow for material separation on the tension. So we can split between tensile and the compressive responses of a constitute model, as I mentioned in a few slides ago. And this can be pretty generally done to almost all hyperelastic models. Then for anisotropic elasticity, we can further develop energy models using the QR decomposition of the deformation gradient. Then the, the energy density as a, it can be done as a, a additive decomposition between tensile, compressive, and fiber contributions. Taking neo hooking as an example, we can break down it into a sharing term the mu term and the volumetric term with lambda. Uh, the sharing term, as you can imagine, penalizes material sharing and the volumetric term penalizes material dilation and contraction. To add the anisotropic behavior to the model, we can further introduce a fiber term. And this fiber term itself uh, has two terms. The first one penalizes stretches in the principal fiber direction, the first fiber direction with stiffness cake X. And if the material is orthotropic, the second term will penalize the stretching in the second direction with stiffness KY. This QR-based anisotropic constitute model is robust to inversions and extremely large deformations. It also avoids the single value decomposition completely. So it's potentially faster to compute. So this approach to anisotropic elasticity does afford us some really exciting fracture results, like these qualitatively accurate bone fractures. However, it does have some limitations. More specifically, extremely stiff materials like these bones 
still require either too small a time step for, for explicit time integration or too many CG iterations for implicit. As such, we want to explore how we can model this extreme stiffness without this limitation. And this finally brings us to the inextensibility solver for NPM. With that motivation in mind, we developed an embedded directional inextensibility solver that allows for the simulation of extremely stiff materials along certain directions. And we do it using hard constraints rather than other typical soft constraints uh, associated with constitutive modeling. Here we begin with the inextensibility enforcing constraint at the top, uh, where we see the time dependent vibe direction A, as well as the allowing rate of strain tensor D as shown on the right. With this constraint in hand, we may write a constraint equation for conservation of momentum as shown on the, in the second row. So notice that in now in this equation, we introduced the notion of the full stress, which includes not only the original stress sigma, but also some unknown tension along the fiber represented in magnitude by this Lagrangian multiplier lambda. And ultimately our goal is to construct a system to solve for velocity V and fiber tension lambda together. So after disc discretizing uh, this Lagrangian multiplier approach, we get a KKT system, but here um, M is the mass matrix B is for the constraints. And since in MPM, we usually do mass lumping, so we can uh, eliminate V because M becomes diagonal. We can eliminate V and solve for the lambda first. And this is very similar to pressure projection in fluid simulation. And the system for lambda can use very efficient uh, multi-grid preconditioned conjugate gradient. So now let's take a look at a couple of advantages of of this insensibility method. Here we show some hang jello blocks. The left two blocks are using insensibility and the right two blocks are simulated with anisotropic elasticity. Within each of these pairs, the left block has fully parallel fibers and the right block, the blue and the yellow, has slightly perturbed fibers, perturbed to like a tiny uh, floating point level degree. But notice that the yellow block on the right struggles to exhibit the behavior we expect. This is because of over-constraining or locking from the super stiff elasticity. Anisotropic elasticity also struggles to model extremely stiff materials without using very small time steps. The six story on the left have ropes modeled with anisotropic elasticity, while the two on the right have inextensible ropes. As you can see, our elasticity causes numerical fracture in the ropes that are carrying heavy artery, while the insensible ropes displays no displacement along its fibers. So now that we've recovered fracture and elasticity, let's finally dive into plasticity. When simulating plasticity, we typically do a multiplicative decomposition of the deformation gradient. We also need to choose a yield surface, which is effectively a 3D boundary in the principal stress space that separates stresses into those that can cause elastic deformations and those that can cause plastic deformations. Points inside this surface represent stresses that cause elastic, and those are recoverable deformations. The stresses outside will cause plastic irreversible deformations. With the yield surface in hand, we can develop a projection routine that involves using the elastic deformation to determine um, where in stress space a particle is. And then if necessary, we could project its stress back to the feasible stress state. Based on this projection, we can also update some hardening variable per particle to keep track of the plastic deformation. And this hardening can influence the shape of the yield surface. So plasticity is most useful for simulating different kinds of solids. It's most useful for simulating fracture in granular media, like snow, soil, ice, wet sand, this kind of stuff. In this picture, we see a large piece of glacier ice carving into the ocean. This has an enormous splash and ensuing waves. 
Modeling this glacier carving is not only pertinent right now due to the inevitable sea level change due to global warming, but also because these types of carving events can also cause fatal tsunamis that could dramatically affect coastal region safety. So, so we developed a new plasticity model for ice fracture in this paper. Uh, without going into any details, the idea is pretty simple. Basically, during the deformation, we keep track of the accumulated deviatoric plastic stress. That is how much plastic deformation was contributed by shearing. Then the yield surface will shrink its size uh, if the ice is going, undergoing tensile loading. That actually allowed us to capture something very exciting. In the image on the, at left, we show a, a 2D view of a rectangular glacier entering a body of water. Here, the glacier has the tracked hardening variable in, the, in darker gray, and the water is colored based on the velocity magnitude. And even more excitingly, we found that, so we did some experiments uh, on an actual pool. We found that this new plasticity model gives us very good quantitative agreement with the analytical bending expression for this type of ice and sea interaction. And here is a 2D version of the real world equip Sumia glacier moving into body, into water. This was taken uh, collected through satellite data and some sensors on boats in the ocean. And notice the fracture, but more importantly, check out the propagation wave. This wave in the real world could potentially be very catastrophic. So it's really exciting that we found the simulated wave speeds to nicely match analytical models and the measurements. And finally, we can see here in 3D, a glacier slowly pushing into the main body of water and gradually breaking apart due to plastic softening. Note that this simulation is of real world scale uh, with real world parameters for ice and water. This has the potential to further our understanding of the sea ice interactions and prevent tsunami related disasters. Now to summarize, as for modeling fracture and damage, we developed NPM discretization for continuum damage mechanics, including for a variety of uh, anisotropic materials. However, we're still missing the ability to model the very fast cracks associated with brittle materials like glass. So it's very desirable and an interesting topic to model strong uh, velocity discontinuities for um, brittle fractures in NPM. Next, within modeling elasticity for fracture, we saw an isotropic split elasticity and the QR-based anisotropic elasticity. And while the inextensibility model could probably use more exploration, it too is very useful for stiff materials in general. For plasticity-based approaches, you saw the example that we found extremely successful for modeling this debris-laden solid fracture in ice. And it's an exciting prospect to try and develop anisotropic yield surfaces to simulate anisotropic granular flow. That's very common in landslides. Here's the acknowledgement. Uh, most of the work I covered today, including a major portion of the slides, are contributed by my first PhD student, Joshua Wolper, uh, who is also graduating this semester. And thank you for listening. All right. Okay, thank you so much, Fan Fu, for the great talk. It's literally such a visual fist. Um, yeah, and because we only have like a couple of minutes left, we'll just have like a quick Q&A session. Okay, so the first question for Samak is like maybe a little bit trivial, but we just wonder like, what topology or say connectivity guarantees like the lead group interpolation has? Like for example, if you have like two connected triangles, like is it like they're a guarantee, like they're connected all throughout the like the interpolation? So no, the straightforward answer to that question is no, because uh, you see uh, 
and the framework is designed to handle a global affine transformations. So we are not talking about uh, uh, mesh interpolations because uh, so in mesh interpolation, what typically happens is you model the deformation between individual elements, um, for example, mm -hmm. triangles or tetrahedrons independently. And then, then there is a constraint overall structure that you that you maintain the connectivity throughout the interpolation process. So, I mean, you can develop uh, a framework in which you can uh, constrain your overall framework uh, for mesh interpolation. But uh, this particular framework is just uh, to interpolate a single affine transformation. So we okay. have similar work, but uh, it, it's not the case here. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, another question for Fanfu is like, uh, say like, say if there's like a piece of glass has a small crack on its surface before it shatters. Is there a way to go from the volumetric particles of the glass to the 1D crank simplex on the surface? That's a, that's a great research question. Something we, are, we, we might be working on in the near future, um, but basically, uh, it essentially corresponds to how to use NPM to discretize co-dimensional materials uh, to, yeah. to actually represent the, the thin surface. Uh, basically, that, that's something you could, you could start from the continuum theory and basically just treat NPM as, a, as kind of um, a way where you, you select your function spaces through the grid, um, but eventually uh, you would do it in a, in a co-dimensional manifold. Oh, okay. But, I see. So it's totally this possible, yeah. I see, I see. Cause like, cause I think like another question like we have is just like answered by you. Cause like, cause, cause I think it's intuitive to say like how, like in, for example, in FEM, we have like volumetric mesh and can also have surface mesh. So we're just like wondering if it's like directly ap applicable to extending MPM to be surface only. But I yeah. think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. something that's Thank gonna you. happen very soon. <laughs> Oh, cool. Then we are looking forward to it. Okay, so another question for Samak is like, would it be useful for say like general 3D deep learning algorithms to be like invariant or say equal, like uh, equivalent to this like leap group interpolations? So I don't think I completely understand the question, but uh, if it is about uh, uh, using the proposed representation in Lie group uh, in deep learning framework, yes, there is a benefit yeah, right, because, right. because mm -hmm. in some sense it linearizes uh, the representation. So you are not really working on the curved space now. So uh, in some sense the the deformation you are talking about is represented in linear space. So this is helpful in deep learning framework to get uh, uh, easier convergence but uh, I, I really have to test it and then comment on it. I see, I see. I, I guess that would be like interesting future work. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, another question for Fanfu is like, which is something actually like we're always wondering. It's just like, say like there are like different phenomena like in the real world, but we just wonder how to pick like say like the most suitable numerical Method to simulism, like either FEM or MPM or even some other like methods? Um, I think so. Basically, MPM is still very young. It was invented in 1995. Compared to finite elements, uh, it's, it has a, lot, a long way to go. Basically, if you like, for th basic, for, I think for any material, you could use either. <laughs> Basically, the only difference between the two is where you put your degree of freedoms at, right? You can put it in mesh, mm -hmm. you can put it in the, you can, you can push your, uh, push forward the LPD into Olarin, so, so you can use NPM grid and solve it in the Olarin space. So it, you, can, you can use either for anything. But I think if you, at the current stage, for, for high order accuracy, if you really need, um, like, things like third order integrators for things like those or, or, or high order elements like in finite elements you can go 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 into um uh, isogeometric isoparametric uh, stuff uh or or isogeometric analysis any of those things are not yet well developed in npm so npm is currently still kind of restricted in first order discretization so for accuracy purposes fem might be the way to go but for then, yeah, 
And for, for certain things like snow or sand, you have to use FPM. <laughs> oh, okay. And you, you can do FPM, sure. but that would require a, a very, it's going to be extremely challenging to do the remission in, in, at the level of the grains. It's doable, but uh, it's not practical enough. Mm -hmm, I see. Yeah, I think it sounds more intuitive, like to say use some particles to represent those instead of like those like volumetric discretizations. Yeah. Okay, I guess that's basically our questions like for today. And we thank both the speakers, like Fen Fu and also Samag. And also we thank the artist. Yeah, Jonathan. Uh, uncalled for designing this week's poster and see you all next week for Sid and Tovaki's session.